Good morning, everyone. Is there any wonderful to be back in person? Yes, yes, yes. I'm delighted to host the fireside chat with a good friend of mine, who's an amazing woman, Caroline Korski. Caroline, please come on stage. Everybody, thank you, Maria. Caroline is not only the new CEO of our factory, our square factory, I said it right. You right? did, just yes, about. Yeah. Just yeah, about. Yeah. But she's an amazing um, woman with a fantastic career. Where did it all start for you, Caroline? Um, so that's a really good question. I want to be really honest and put my hands up right here straight away and say I'm an arts graduate. Anybody <laughs> else in the room with an arts degree? Oh, thank God, my people. Um, <laughs> so I, I went into technology at a profoundly lucky time because my career really started in the mid-90s. I left university in 1995. And at that point, it was still possible to go into organisations and enthuse them about the potential of this brand spanking new technology, the World Wide Web, which some senior execs hadn't really, hadn't really heard of yet. Um, and as a result, even though I was an arts graduate and even though I really had no, you know, no right to be purporting to be able to code, I could go and teach myself HTML 2.0 because I'm that old and Perl and a bit of JavaScript and, um, and have a conversation indeed with the first boss I had uh, in a temp job that I was doing where I said he was a marketing director and I said, have you heard about this thing called the web? And he said, no. And I said, well, you know that incredibly expensive catalogue that you make for the things you're trying to sell that, you know, takes weeks and months to produce and you end up proofreading it on galleys because that's this is prior to digital printing uh, and you have to ship it, the files out to China to get them printed up and then it takes weeks to send them back again. Uh, and if there's anything wrong with them, then you just have to run with a misprint in the first edition until you can get the next edition printed. I can take all of that pain and I can put it on the Internet so that people can just come and look at the bits that they want to look at and they can buy things from you directly without you ever having to print a paper catalogue again. And he said, oh, that sounds amazing. I'm not going to stop printing the paper catalogue this year, but why don't you build us a website and we'll see what, what happens with it. And that was exactly how it started. 2,000 hand pages of HTML 2.0. And they never really stopped printing the catalogue in its entirety, but they certainly greatly reduced the print run. What a great start of your career. And then you went next to? So then I, I kind of got the bug for technology. I got the bug like for how do. technology changes businesses. Um, I got the bug for how emerging technologies bring new opportunities, new, new markets that can be exploited, um, about how they change the way that people are and the way that people work. Um, and so then I moved to a, uh, a startup. Uh, who uh, at the time were called Fletcher Research, who had been uh, started up to look at the internet and how it was going to change business models, starting by looking at what the internet was doing to sports and to sports consumption, uh, particularly the digital rights negotiations that were going on uh, at the beginning of B-Sky B, taking you know, big, big rights deals forward. Um, and, and that little startup business was acquired eventually by Forrester Research, who you may have heard of, um, so then I spent some time working as an analyst within Forrester before uh, heading out into mm -hmm. the world of business on the other side, on the client side, to help really big organisations think about how their businesses were going to be transformed by a series of emerging technologies. So the mobile internet, big data, uh, VR, AR, artificial intelligence, new forms of communication, um, and, uh, and that's really kind of where we end up with Rolls-Royce, I suppose, eventually very interesting experience that you brought forward in 2022 uh, where you have set up R squared and you're the CEO. Mm. How is this experience different for all the other jobs you've had, especially those require you to set up new ventures, develop new initiatives? So I've been involved in a number of new ventures over my career, probably four or five, uh, usually as a member of the early team mm. or occasionally as a member of the founding team. Um, this is different. It's different when you're the CEO, uh, <laughs> um, which I hadn't really, I think, appreciated before. It, uh, I, and the reason I say that is because 
um, although part of your job as a CEO is to find the most amazing founding team who can really bring your vision forward and, and make it land in the real world and then wrap round that founding team the most extraordinary practitioners who can really deliver on that vision. The reality is, as the CEO, it's still your vision. Um, and that can, be quite, uh, that can be quite lonely, particularly in the dark reaches of the nights when you, something that you've tried to do hasn't worked perhaps the way that you hoped it would. Um, and even though you've got a superb team around you, sometimes that can just feel quite isolating. Just, you know, oh my goodness, these people depend on us being able to deliver this, this thing that we're trying to deliver. Um, how are we going to take it forward? I've had to learn really important lessons in how to lean into the team who support me, because um, that's not an easy thing to do when it's your baby that you're trying to bring into the mm. world. But if you don't lean into that team, if you don't really uh, benefit from all of that creativity and collaboration and vision that your team is able to, to bring to your initiative, then, then that loneliness never goes away and, and actually your decision making becomes less and less reliable. And collaboration is exactly the secret sauce needed for us to be able to solve the big societal problems we are now discussing at this conference and all of us, the race to net zero. So how can collaboration truly be that secret sauce that helps us to see progress with the solutions we're developing in climate change, but frankly, everything else, all the societal problems we have? Yeah, I mean, the truth is um, we set up the R Squared factory um, in March of this year is when we launched, but, but we, we started building the, the capabilities, the competencies, the experiences that sit behind the R-squared factory all the way back in 2017. And they draw on more than three decades of experience in Rolls-Royce of using advanced data analytics to address really big systemic industrial problems. Um, and that's, that's really important because the truth is that the, that the problems we face today, particularly the problems around, you know, how do we build more sustainable supply chains? How do we reduce carbon emissions? How do we get to a position where uh, there is a greater diversity and representation around the, the data streams that make decisions for our lives? How do we maintain inclusiveness, not only within the Western world, uh, you know, across our diverse populations, but also in, into the global South? How do we take how do we take the benefits of the technologies that we are working with across the entire planet and not just limit them to a, to a narrow group? Those are system-wide challenges. Mm. And no single industrial organisation can start to solve them or, or certainly finish to solve them on its own. Um, they don't control enough data. The data that they do control is not of the right kind of quality. It suffers from significant issues of data scarcity. They don't have access to enough of the right resources. And even if they did, they aren't able to define a problem clearly enough to be able to generate an effective answer unless they collaborate with the rest of the integrated system that is facing into that problem. So for us, if you want to start looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence to solve some of the world's biggest industrial mm. problems, you have to do that from a basis of collaboration. You have to do that in a way that takes away some of the, the, the competitive instinct of large organisations and, and challenges them to think about the scale of these problems and how solutions to these problems will actually be generated together. But the way you describe collaboration it sounds like we really need to start updating our cultures, our ways of working, rethink how we balance being competitive with being collaborative and open. Isn't this a challenge, especially for companies like Rolls-Royce, like mine, PwC, and frankly, every big company out there? Yeah, I mean, when we look at the way that machine learning and artificial intelligence helps to address industrial problems, there are essentially three bits of that process that are difficult. Uh, and only one of those is in fact attached to machine learning or artificial intelligence. So at the front end, you've got a problem which is about data, about the quality of data, about the scarcity of data, about the degree to which when you're looking at a problem where the answer you're building shows up physically in the real world, you cannot abstract that data away from the domain specialist knowledge of how it applies an answer. So that's the first set of problems, they're data-related problems. And the second set of problems is actually not to do with technology at all. Mm. It's cultural. It's about how do organisations get themselves into a position culturally, culturally and operationally where they're actually able to release value 
from the application of those machine learning techniques to the industrial problems. And my colleague Manisha was talking a little bit about cultural transformation earlier on this morning. Now, what we've learned across those five years in Rolls-Royce is that you can have the best data science community in the world, and we have a fabulous data science community in the R-squared factory. But quite frankly, if you don't invest in addressing the data problem and in addressing the culture problem, you could put your data scientists into a room with a mountain of 50 pound notes and a box of matches and probably some petrol, because they're not going to be able to generate value from the work that they're doing if those cultures don't change. I think across the pandemic, we saw this happening in ways which have really unlocked some of the potential for our squared factory and, and have led us to accelerate the work that we're doing in the outside world, outside of Rolls-Royce. We saw the potential for collaborations in response to an incredible crisis that you know, was really difficult for all of us. Rolls-Royce and R-Squared Data Labs specifically brought together the Emergent Alliance, which was a community of more than 50 organizations looking at how to use data science to, uh, to develop ways to respond economically to the COVID-19 pandemic. How could we reduce the impact of the recession that you know, we are now living through? How could we help planners to make decisions about how to switch economies back on faster, but in a way which was safe? That spirit of collaboration, those were 50 organizations who would normally have been in competition with each other, including four of the top five tech companies who generally don't collaborate with each other unless you know, there's a really important reason why they should. So we were hugely thrilled that we could help bring that group together. And we've taken learnings from that experience forward mm -hmm. into the work that we deliver at the R Squared factory. Going back to R Squared and the history of the new company and how you came to life. Um, I know that you have had quite a bit of impact on the digital transformation of Rolls Royce itself. Mm. And now you're looking to leverage this experience for other companies that will be your future clients. Can you tell us a little bit more about the digital transformation journey based very much on those uh, core principles of collaborations, breaking the silos, bringing people together, teaching them how to exchange knowledge, how to communicate effectively for a common goal? Yeah, I mean, for us, um, we did really two things inside of Rolls-Royce, which I think um, I've, I've talked about a little bit before, but, uh, but I'll explain perhaps to you um, now. We, we, we understood that our role as a digital cultural transformation unit was not simply about um, presenting people with new technical skills that they could consume. It, it was about really generating mindset change. In fact, I remember going in front of the board of Rolls-Royce in um, the autumn of 2018, just after I'd taken over as the, the head of R Squared Data Labs and saying, I just want to check what it is I think you want me to do, because <laughs> I, ne I need to make sure you understand we're on the same journey. I think you want me to help produce a species level evolutionary shift inside your organization. Now, Rolls-Royce is 138 years old. A species level evolutionary shift is a very, very big move for an organization of that age and that scale. <laughs> um, and we are on that journey. I would not dream of being so arrogant as to say that we have achieved the whole of that species level evolutionary shift, but we are certainly much further forward than we were five years ago. And much of that, and forgive the extremely inappropriate metaphor, is because we approach this as if we were ourselves a virus. We looked for ways to infect the population with mindset change. We found, we found champions who could be T cells for us, who could turn the immune system on itself and make it possible for this brilliant, technically extraordinary organization to progress really rapidly from its excellence as a 20th century business into the potential for excellence as a 21st century business. And given Warren's East, my CEO, he's speaking later this afternoon, given his intent and ambition to make Rolls-Royce one of the businesses solving the sustainable power problem that we face as a world, that transition was fundamentally important. It's fantastic you brought us to our subject, but we wanted to present to you the whole context of our square. So did you understand why they're so well positioned to address problems like sustainability? So talking about sustainability and ambition of Rolls-Royce to be 
one of the leaders in the field of sustainability. How does technology you've developed at Rolls-Royce aligns with this ambition and vision and how technology should be uh, one of the main driver in helping us achieving net zero? Yeah, we're very clear, uh, both within Rolls-Royce, but in our squared factory as well, that we genuinely don't believe that we will get to net zero without the application of artificial intelligence. And let me be very, very clear about that. The, the kinds of optimizations that we need to be able to operate across distributed energy networks, the kinds of ways we need to think about how we, uh, we provide for the vital power that we still need, but doing so in a way which is sustainable and which you know, massively reduces or reverses our dependence on, on carbon emitting power sources. Those challenges need artificial intelligence to be able to build out the flexibility, the agility, the responsiveness of the consumption networks and the generating networks that we need to be able to achieve that objective. Um, we, need, we need artificial intelligence because we need to think about things like how do we control uh, you know, completely new modes of transport that have degrees of autonomy in them that will only be manageable using data science and machine learning. We need to think about how do we uh, change uh, our, uh, our economy from a, from a waste consumption perspective. Mm. And we're going to need artificial intelligence to understand how do we make the best choices about the, the, the raw materials that we choose to use, how we combine them to make new products, and then how we decombine them at end of life in order to feed them back into a circular system, to, to break the habit that we have of making things and throwing them away. So those are the kinds of challenges. They are system-wide challenges. They will need artificial intelligence to help answer them. Fantastic. Since we started talking about the use cases, shall we dig a little bit deeper into the ones that you are working on? First, let's start with carbon reduction. Um, what are, how did you achieve, or what's the, the type of solution you put together uh, using artificial intelligence, but also all other capabilities, not just AI? Mm -hmm. So um, when you think about industrial supply chains, uh, generally speaking, most industrial supply chains are, are relatively complex. In the case of an industrial supply chain like Rolls-Royce, or indeed perhaps a pharmaceutical supply chain, or even an automotive or compute supply chain, so when you're thinking about the high compute supply chains, you're often dealing with very rare elements in those supply chains, rare raw materials, um, and you're sometimes dealing with, um, with very uh, high risk supply chains, i.e. you may only have one or two suppliers in the whole world who can actually make the components and products that you need to be able to, to create whatever it is that you're creating. Those, that complexity, both in the rareness of the materials in where they come from in the world and in, and in the relative scarcity of suppliers, can make it extremely difficult for human beings trying to make buying decisions just using their own brains to be able to optimize for really anything else other than perhaps cost or possibly uh, protecting supply. So you might be able to optimize for a combination of cost and, and risk of supply as a mm. human. We worked with the buyers in Rolls-Royce to look at a, a, a number of our key strategic supply chain purchasing routes to understand how could we apply a machine learning optimization engine to not only allow them to optimize for cost, but also to optimize for the security of supply, to optimize for the ge geographic proximity of suppliers, and as a result, to reduce carbon emissions from those key components by 40%. So suddenly we're in a position where when you start to introduce artificial intelligence into what have previously been human-driven mm -hmm. processes, not as a replacement for those humans, because the buyers are still handling the negotiations with the suppliers as a human-to-human -human exchange. You don't get the best price if all you're doing is running a reverse auction with a couple of bots. But being able to give them the scenarios to help them manage multiple optimization strategies simultaneously was how an AI showed up in reducing, frankly, not only the carbon footprint of that supply chain by 40%, but more, but also critically important, the cost of sourcing those components by almost 200 million pounds. 
And since we, since we are discussing about use cases, I'm being very interested to hear uh, your work around circular economy. Right? Finally, we got our senses and we moved from our linear thinking and understanding that everything in nature is cyclical. We are starting applying this principle to circular economy, and this is where again technology can make a big difference. What sort of use cases have you work around um, empowering circular economy? Yeah, again, so I want you to think about industrial processes of manufacture. So if you think about people who make things out of, you know, metal, for example, or indeed any kind of, you know, sizable stuff that you dig out of the ground, generally speaking, and Rolls-Royce is a good example here, you know, you're purchasing that raw material in block form. But the first thing that happens with some of the extremely expensive metals that Rolls-Royce purchases in order to, to make into parts of its, uh, of its machines and its products in use is that they get smelted down, right? They get melted and turned into alloys. Other things get added in them to change the properties of those metals so that they can be fit for purpose. Then they get reformed into a different shape. Then they get machined, so bits of them get drilled off or holes get made in them, or new, new shapes are, are, are introduced to them. Uh, then they may, get, they may get forged or welded together with something else. But we've started off by paying for a block at the beginning. We should be able to understand all the way through that process how much is being wasted at every single stage of that process. That's an incredibly valuable raw material that we've paid for in a cuboid form, but what we end up with at the end is something that's a beautifully manufactured, honed component. The challenge we faced, though, was that the designs that showed us the transition from the cuboid block of metal that you purchased to the final designed piece of equipment that you got at the end, those exist as engineering drawings. They are 2D drawings with geometries written on them. To be able to actually understand, has the waste material that's being produced been captured properly? Has it been picked up off the factory floor? Has it been collected out of the smelter? Is it being recycled for better use somewhere else? You need to not understand just the 2D drawing and what you're expecting. You need to understand every single 3D process that that component has gone through in its life. So we built um, a, a, an NLP and computer vision capability that combines looking at the 2D can turn 2D geometries into 3D geometries, and it can also scan documents for tabular and scientific notation so that it can understand exactly what geometry you are expecting from your initial purchase of a block of, of materials to the final component. And understanding those geometries across the life cycle of the development of that component gives the, you the ability to know how much waste you are expecting, to manage to reduce that race, waste, and to accurately recycle that waste. It's fantastic. Very good, to, very, very good to hear. Before we move to questions, we have about six or seven minutes. I want to go back to R squared and the ambition you have for the company. Where do you say, where do you see R squared playing an important role in accelerating or um, being a big player in the race towards net zero? Where do you think uh, you differentiate uh, against your competitors? And frankly, in consulting, there's quite a bit of competition. <laughs> I would know. Absolutely. There I work. <laughs> From our perspective, there are I think a, real, a couple of really important things that are different about the R squared factory. And, and the first is that we, we would not consider ourselves to be in direct competition with organizations like PwC because our model is based on collaboration. We genuinely believe that the way that you get to some of the answers around the biggest questions the world faces, industrial questions about the application of machine learning and AI, have to be through the collaboration between organizations who might perhaps have considered themselves to be in competition with each other before, but are prepared to set that competitive instinct aside because the scale of the problem is big enough that they know they need to work together to solve it. The R Squared Factory is a safe place to do hard things. That's what it exists for. It is a place to bring organizations together to help them to think about how they can generate value not only for themselves, but also across their networks, across the value systems that they operate within in order to solve some of those really big problems, like climate change, like sustainability across supply chains, like cultural transformation, like how do you build trustworthy and ethical artificial intelligences when you're trying to deploy them into physical processes. And you just got to the subject that I like the most, of course. 
what about the ethics, ethics of technology in general? And uh, we had countless conversations about how ethics of AI, how important ethics of AI is the context of Rolls-Royce and R-squared. And I know that you have uh, released a fantastic AI ethics framework, which is uh, top of the art and uh, could be considered as a, a leader in the field. So I would like us to talk a little bit about the vision around the ethics of technology at R squared and have, what have you learned in um, Rolls Royce and you're now able to share with the world in terms of how should we do ethics, how important ethics is in the context of collaboration and how collaborating collaboration is a core of the culture of R squared will accelerate um, uh, Adopt, uh, adoption and um, development of ethical technology, not just AI? Mm. Well, I mean, I suppose if there's one thing, there are lots of things I've learned from my time inside Rolls Royce, and I'm enormously grateful to the organisation for giving me that opportunity to try to help bring that transformation that they asked me for. But if there's one thing I would put my hand on my heart and say I've taken away most strongly from my time in, that, in, in, in Rolls Royce, it's never, ever be afraid to do the hard thing because it's doing the hard things that actually results in change. And doing hard things when you're talking about the future of our planet and the future that we are building for our children has to mean sharing and it has to mean collaborating and it has to mean putting aside otherwise narrow competitive instincts and realizing that the scale of the problem is so big that we need to work together. And that ethical underpinning sits under everything that the R squared factory does. Um, it's part of the way that we believe we exist in the world, but it does come from that Rolls Royce ethos. Do the hard thing. Don't be afraid of doing the hard thing. That's doing the hard thing is when stuff matters. Breaking the boundaries. That's all about the conversation we have around the ethics of technology. How do we understand that we need to disrupt the way we work, the way we live in order to see what AI is capable of, right? And doing the hard things is sometimes the hardest thing ever, especially when it's not embedded in your culture. Now it's time for questions. Um, why don't we take two or three questions at a time before you answer the question? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try and hold them in my mind. Here, two. In the front. Um, at, at the heart of what, what you're espousing today is, is collaboration. Where, where does um, data sovereignty and data protection fit in there? Excellent question. Can we take another one? Uh, good morning. Thank you so much, Caroline. I really appreciate your presentation. I've got a bit of a binary question, for which I apologise. Um, I wondered whether you'd looked at fuels for jet engines and whether you are or could look at the synthetic fuel mixes and whether you've come to a view on jet A with ethanol, synthetic fuels, hydrogen, ammonia, and where you think the mix of those is um, for now and for the next 30 years. Thank you. First round. Okay, so I'm going to answer that second question first, because yes, at a Rolls-Royce level, I am not the right person to answer your question in with precision. So I will very happily introduce you to some colleagues who can give you a much better answer. But the, the, the long and the short answer is yes, we absolutely are investigating sustainable aviation fuels and indeed hydrogen. We believe that the future involves both of those. Um, and we have been testing uh, our engines on both uh, drop-in sustainable aviation fuel and indeed uh, moving towards testing our engines towards 100% sustainable aviation fuel. Um, our Pearl engine operates, uh, has been through testing on sustainable 100% uh, SAF. Um, so yes, th those are critical parts of the progression towards uh, net zero for the aviation industry. Uh, but it will be a mixture of both. It won't be one or the other. And your question on data, data sovereignty. Um, now, we're very lucky in, in the world in which um, R squared has been operating in the past in that um, in the industrial use cases of AI, we, we don't generally have to deal with much personally identifiable information. But clearly, it's critically important as we as we build into some of these new collaborations that we're dealing with. Um, 
our approach, and it's something that we inherited really from, um, from the work we've delivered inside Rolls-Royce, is that when we work in collaborations with organisations, they own their data sovereignty. It's their data. They, they will be the controller of that data. Um, and, and if they choose to join a collaboration and share that data, there is a, a cross-licensing that happens within the collaboration to allow the participants to, to work on that data together. But ultimately, it still resides with the organisations whose data it is. And that's actually really important in the context of machine learning because it's, it's actually really hard to abstract away the, 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 the model um, from the data that's being used for, just, as, just in the same way as it's very difficult to abstract away the output that you're looking for from the domain that you're trying to build that output into. So if you don't acknowledge the sovereignty of, of the originator of that data, then you are in a very tricky position because, uh, because you, you will eventually find it very difficult to actually generate real value from the deployment of any application that, that consumes that data. And so that's our approach. Um, in terms of how that then works out in, uh, in, a, in a set of use cases around uh, personally identifiable information from individual people, um, I will express a personal view on this, but it's not necessarily a, a view informed by the work we do on the industrial basis. I have always believed that we need to evolve a far clearer understanding of our own sovereignty, of our own personal data. I have been frustrated for probably the best part of 25 years that the multiple initiatives, my data, um, uh, for example, being, being one that I worked on 15 years ago as part of Telefonica, um, haven't really um, taken hold the way I would like them to. And I think that if we don't do a better job of helping our children understand quite how much value they're giving away every time they freely trade their information for a meme of a cat on a skateboard, then we're doing a really bad job. Much to catch up when it comes to digital and data literacy. The next questions. Hello there. Um, my name is Alex. I run a, a carbon capture scheme um, where farmers uh, use regenerative practices to absorb carbon and then package that up into carbon credits to sell to corporates. Um, so my question is, uh, what opportunities do you see there are for collaboration and machine learning and AI in the space of carbon credits? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Take another one. Hi, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the AI ethics framework, how you develop that and some of the applications of it. Okay, brilliant. I will answer your question first, and then I'll come on to yours. Um, so I'm going to have a, a, wee, a wee bit of a devil's advocate position, and you'll have to forgive me. Um, I worry a little bit about the notion of trading carbon credits using machine learning models I worry a little bit about it because at the moment I don't see enough clear governance and transparency that we aren't simply moving the problem from one place to another place without really resolving it. So I think when so I think what we will need is we will need the ability not only to use data science to help us to, to build out the kinds of trading platforms that allow for carbon credits to become a, a more commonly used way of trying to address the problem. But we will also need a provenance and governance model, which actually validates that when I buy a carbon credit, I'm, I'm, the carbon is really being saved, right? Rather than simply I'm buying the potential of a tree being planted, which in 150 years might consume and lock up the carbon that I have produced today. So I think we need both. We need, we, need, we need the trading environment, which I think probably will be an, you know, an, an AI-led or an ML-led context, but we need the governance models, the transparency um, and the provenance to, to assure that what we're doing has an, has an effect now and isn't simply buying, in inverted commas, a benefit in 50, 150, 250 years' time. Uh, now, you asked a question about uh, the AI ethics framework. It's called the Aletheia framework for anybody who wants to, to have a look for it. You can get hold of it on the Rolls-Royce 
Com website. We published it under Creative Commons license, so it's freely available, um, open source. We produced a variant 2.0 uh, December of this year, just gone, where we also released a data bias framework as, a, as an additional element. Um, essentially, it is a very, very practical 32 ethic checklist, which allows you as an AI developer, and some of my development team are here and uh, and can tell you about how they use it, but um, it allows you as an AI developer to think about the questions you need to ask yourself to demonstrate that an AI application is being developed safely and ethically, but also asks you to demonstrate not only what realization principles you're using to achieve the ethics, but the actual evidence that you've taken those realization mm. principles in, into action that can then be monitored against. Um, we use it across Rolls-Royce. It is a mandated part of our digital product development and product safety um, process. We also use it with our suppliers. So we ask our suppliers to, um, uh, to attest to the fact that they either use Aletheia themselves or they have an equivalent uh, trustworthiness and safety framework in their own organisations too. I have a follow-up question before we take another one because I think this framework and, and the approach you took is is could be inspiring for a lot of organizations that struggle to demonstrate how they uphold ethical principles. Are you planning to publish a set of uh, stories or learnings and demonstrate how you brought it to life and what else is needed to enable um, an increase of transparency about the processes around AI? Mm. So we already have a number of stories published, but, um, but yes, I'm sure there will be more upcoming um, as we continue to work. Our approach with Aletheia, as you, I hope you would expect, is a collaborative one. <laughs> so um, we, for example, collaborated with a group of oncologists um, from the US and the UK uh, over the course of 2021. Uh, they came to us to say, could they look at how they could use the Aletheia framework to help them develop or indeed uh, uh, a test and manage trustworthy artificial intelligence applications in the context of treating cancer with radiation therapy. There are AI tools used to map radiation therapies to treat cancers and they wanted to understand mm. what could they take from the Aletheia framework to apply in, in the treatment of cancer using artificial intelligence applications to, to map radiation treatments. Um, and that uh, collaboration resulted in a publication in the AI in Oncology Journal in January of this year, uh, which shows how the read across from, um, from a, an, an engineering led AI trustworthiness and safety use case, the, the Rolls Royce use case for Aletheia, uh, maps then into a, a healthcare um, use case in oncology. Interestingly, we also worked with um, a startup called Musio, who have recently been acquired by Help Me Out SoundCloud, I think. Is that right? I can't remember. Um, which is very exciting because I'm very pleased that they've been acquired. But anyway, um, they, um, they use the Aletheia framework. They, they use AI to produce um, track lists. They use the Aletheia framework to make sure that they were demonstrating uh, inclusiveness and diversity in their track listing which is a really interesting but totally different use case for the framework, you know, from one which is about safety in, a, in healthcare treatments to one which is about inclusion and the representation of artists from multiple backgrounds in the automated selection of track listing. Fantastic. We need all those examples so badly because otherwise we, we run the risk of not, not having the results we, we, we expect from applying ethical thinking uh, on technology. And this will only give confidence and hopefully empower others not only to be a bit more brave and, and publish their approach on AI ethics um, and uh, to that extent ethics of technology in general, but being able to engage in those conversations with diverse stake of, uh, group of stakeholders. I think we have time for two or three more questions. Um, I think there was a head up over there in the corner. Another one, that corner. Thank you. Yeah, yeah hi. So obviously with a company like Rolls-Royce, you've got, I don't know, maybe tens of thousands of employees, and I don't know how big your team is, but I've worked in large organizations where sometimes they like to hire somebody in with a very great innovative feel, you know, really great sense of what the landscape is, and then do absolutely nothing with it. So, <laughs> so I suppose there is this kind of question that's nagging in the back of my mind is, how do you really make sure that you're having a, an impact on the business? And are there is the business listening? Mm. And are they really taking that forward? Yeah, no, good question. So we have a, just a second, because we yes. have another question in the corner, that corner. 
two and two. Yep, it's coming. Thanks, Caroline. As part of the species level mindset shift you're talking about at Rolls-Royce, could you explain how you're driving the adoption and trust of that cultural level shift? It's okay to talk at a principal level, but how do you truly ingrain it into the DNA of Rolls-Royce? Uh, sure, absolutely. I, I will try and answer both of those questions sort of in one answer, if you like, but because um, actually they're quite interlinked. Um, but I'll, uh, hopefully, I'll do a good enough job of, of answering both of you. Um, one of the things that was really important to us over the five years um, inside Rolls-Royce before we span the factory out um, was actually our obligation to deliver real measurable value to the company. Now, that's quite rare when you look at innovation teams. I'm not suggesting that innovation teams don't deliver value. They absolutely do. But you'll often find that innovation teams are tasked over some sort of five, three to five year trajectory. And so there's a kind of, you know, a kind of earmarked pot of cash that usually the C-suite puts forward to say, you can, you know, go and think creative thoughts about how you're going to lead change. And, uh, and over a three to five year trajectory, we will expect to return on the investment that we're making in you. That isn't the model that we built for our Square Data Labs. Our Square Data Labs delivered, was, was tasked with delivering as a minimum its own cost base every single year of operation. And, and that value delivery had to show up in the P&L of the organization. And that's how I know that the team that now uh, is the, 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 the team that we have taken out as R squared factory helped Rolls-Royce to deliver almost half a billion dollars worth of value over the five years that we, we worked with them um, in R squared data labs. And, uh, and we don't stop with the value that we delivered them from the factory team, what we built for Rolls-Royce still exists. Our Square Data Lab still exists inside Rolls-Royce. It's federated into every part of the organization. So it, it's still there. It's, you know, there are altogether about 250 R Square Data Labs members of the organization still operating in Rolls-Royce, still delivering value from uh, machine learning, data analytics. Um, and they have a, a core central team who are focused on the kind of cutting edge activity um, with data science and AI. Um, and the R Squared Factory group who, who we, ha we are spinning out really are, are leading in the opportunity to build those very big systemic change dynamics through the kinds of collaborations that we operate. So Rolls-Royce continues to be a major client of the R Squared Factory. They come and work with us when they have big systemic change that they want to deliver across networks. Um, but to your question of how do you ensure that value actually shows up, the best way is to have to sit in a room with a bunch of finance directors and say, show me where the money is, because that's how you demonstrate that you're actually delivering value. It's, it's quite a hard pill to swallow mm. if you come from an innovation background, because many innovation leaders are not used to that rigor in terms of year on year value realization. And it's a, it's a really critical part of the R squared factory methodology that when we work with our clients, we bring that year-on-year -year value delivery approach with us in the work that we do so that they can be confident that their work is also delivering value. Um, and to the question then um, uh, about how, I guess, that you show that that mindset change is happening, um, uh, I mean, you can show that somewhat through volumes, although Manish always tells me off when I do it that way. Um, but it, let's, let's start there, because it's an easy thing to count. So in, the, in uh, 2021, which is the last year for which I can remember the numbers, forgive me, we put 35,000 members of the, the Rolls-Royce employee base through more than 76,000 hours of training. Um, whether that be mindset shift training, whether that be uh, self-taught you know, uh, new coding uh, adoption, whether that be um, thinking about data ethics, whether that be um, thinking about agile. We, during uh, 2020, we, we trained the entirety of the top 100 in agile methodology, and we then told them to tell us who to train next. So by the end of 2020, we trained 4,500 uh, senior and middle managers uh, across Rolls-Royce in agile. Um, as a, as, and, and as a result of that, we saw process times for 
non-technical projects, so these were not necessarily software development projects, but process times for non-technical projects dropping all over the business because suddenly individuals with authority in the organisation had been introduced to a new way of thinking about the dynamics of running a programme of activity. So it's those sorts of, those are the sorts of metrics that you can see. Manisha would, would tell me the most powerful shifts that really that happened and that are since then happening with other of our industrial customers is the identification of those T-cell champions that I mentioned earlier. Those people inside organisations who do the transformation for you. Because the real truth is those sorts of scale of numbers, they come from that, that layer of evangelists, champions, pioneers who, who are part of the business but who have a passion for change. And it's finding those, encouraging them, making them understand that their role in leading that transformation is really important and that they should feel safe in expressing the challenges that they need to, to put forward. That's how you actually achieve the scale of numbers I just talked about. Well, thank you very much. That's okay. Time flies when you're having fun. Caroline and I can spend hours talking and then we decided maybe we should have two episodes. So <laughs> this is the first episode. The second one is coming on Wednesday when we change roles. Yeah, Caroline will be moderating a panel. Uh, I'll be the panelist. And we'll be discussing about how we should forget about Elon Musk and ask demand for AI to do more. And also Caroline is on stage today talking about stakeholder cap capitalism at uh, 3 p.m. Um, Which yes. stage? I can't. Here. Here. Again. Sorry. No. Oh, sorry. Global leadership, leadership stage. stage. Someone who knows what they're doing is in the audience. That's marvellous. Join me in thanking the fabulous Caroline Gorski, CEO of R-Square. <laughs>